This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, this morning I want to share a message with you that I have wanted to preach for some time. It is one of those messages that, quite honestly, I feel like is very lacking uh, among churches in America today, even among Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches, but certainly among churches in general. It is a message that continues the theme that we began several weeks ago, uh, So Great Salvation. And uh, unless the Lord changes what He has put on my heart so far, um, we probably will have one more message in the series, So Great Salvation, uh, before we finish out the series. But in my personal estimation, the message that I'd like to present this morning is perhaps the most important of all the sermons that I will preach in this particular series on the subject of salvation. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, would you turn with me to our text this morning found in the book of Acts, chapter number 20. While you're turning there, let me just say by way of introduction that the topic this morning is a topic that I believe is is so important. We cannot afford to get it wrong. For if we get this one subject wrong, we could be right about everything else related to the Bible, related to God, but if we fail to get this one right, none of the others will even matter. If you're able to, would you please stand with me this morning out of respect for God's Word as I read our text found into the book of Acts, chapter number 20, beginning in verse 18. Dr. Luke, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this about one of Paul's encounters on his missionary journeys. Verse 18 says, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to bring you a message this morning that addresses the question of what must a person repent to be saved? Of what must a person repent to be saved? This question, of course, is of the utmost importance. It's of the utmost importance to the lost in order for them to be saved. It's of the utmost importance to those that are saved to know how to properly present the plan of salvation, the gospel message, and the invitation to those that are still lost. We cannot afford to be wrong in this one thing. We must get it right. So this morning I'd like to bring a message entitled, The Role of Repentance in Salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that even though we've prayed other times this morning, that dear God, in these few moments, you would quieten our hearts, focus our attention, sharpen our ability to understand the Word of God through your Spirit. I pray this morning that those that are here that might be lost or those listening online would be convicted of sin, Righteousness and judgment. 
that the gospel would be more clear than it ever has been before. I pray for those of us that are saved, that dear God, we would see as clearly as ever before the plan of salvation, the gospel message as we are intended to share it, so that those with whom we witness will understand it, see their need for Christ, and be saved. Lord, I pray you'd use this message for your glory, for it's in Jesus' name and for His sake we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. The subject of repentance and salvation, it certainly is the most important question in the entire Bible. And it's the most important question in our lives that we will ever be confronted with. Whether it's a saved person or a lost person, this is something that everyone needs to know. I want to share as I begin this morning... The stories of three individuals. I will not mention any last names, only first names. First of all, there's Larry. Larry was a young man. He was in his 20s. Larry was not a bad person. But like all of us, he had sin in his life. And recently, after having gone to church a number of times... Larry had come under real conviction about the things he was doing wrong in his life. As a young man in his 20s, as you can imagine, there were things that he knew he was doing that were wrong. One morning in church, Larry goes forward at invitation time under the conviction of the things in his life that he knows he's been doing that are wrong. He knows there's something wrong in his life. He goes down to the altar at invitation time and he begins to pray as best he knows how, telling God he's sorry for the things he's done that are wrong. Larry tries to remember all of the things that he can think of that he's done wrong and starts silently just naming them to God because he's sincerely sorry. The preacher goes over to him as he's getting up from the altar to go back to his seat. And the preacher asks him what he came forward for. Larry, not knowing really much about the Bible, says, I came forward to pray to tell God all the things I've done that are wrong that I can remember because I'm sincerely sorry. The preacher even asks him, Larry, are you sure you're sincerely sorry for your sins? Larry says, yes, sir. I'm sincerely sorry. That's, that's why I came to the altar to, to name those things to God. The preacher then shakes Larry's hand and says, Larry, I'm glad you're sincerely sorry for your sins. Welcome to the family of God. That's the first story. The second story is a woman named Amy. Amy was a few years older than Larry would have been. The two did not know each other. Unfortunately, Amy had a little different background. She too was a lost person. But Amy was on the rebellious side of life. She was running around with the wrong crowd and had been all the way back to her teenage years. Amy was involved with drinking, smoking, using marijuana, living an immoral lifestyle with more than one person. But Amy, too, came forward at the end of a church service one day, in a large church, no less, and she was totally brokenhearted about the things she had been doing. She had not really intended to even go to church that day, but she had gone as a, as a favor to a family member that had invited her and impressed upon her that 
it would be a special thing for them if she joined them. After hearing the preacher preach, Amy was broken hearted over her sins. The lifestyle she had been living. She was weeping tears before she even got down to the altar in front. She came down front broken hearted and knelt at the altar. She too didn't know what to pray. She just was weeping with a broken heart because she knew she was lost. She knew the things she was doing were against God. At this particular church, a different church than the one Larry had attended, the preacher came over to Amy, put his arm around her there at the altar, and asked why she had come. She said something similar to what Larry said. She said, Preacher, I know I'm living and doing things that God hates. I want to get saved this morning. My grandma has been praying for me for years. My mama and my daddy have been praying for me for years. I came as a favor to the family this morning, but I finally, I just want to get saved. I want, a, I want a different life than what I've been living. I want to be different. I want to be changed. The preacher with his arm around Amy there at the altar says something like this. Well, Amy, you just need to pray through. Stay here at the altar as long as you need to and just pray through. Amy didn't know what pray through meant. She just knew she was weeping because she was sorry for her sins and the things she had done that were wrong. She just stayed at the altar weeping. Trying to do basically the same thing Larry had done and, and name as much as she could think of the things she had done that were wrong. Because she wanted to be saved. And all she, could, all she knew to do was name the things she had done wrong. The preacher gathered a few of the ladies in the church to him while the invitation was still going on and he explained to them that Amy was at the altar praying through. Some of the other dear ladies there in the church, they came and they gathered around Amy there at the altar. They put their hands on her, they knelt beside her and they began to weep with her. This church continued to have the invitation the whole time Amy was there. What seemed to her like an hour, probably wasn't an hour, but it was an extended, extended invitational time. Finally, at some point, Amy was so exhausted from crying. All the tears she had were cried out. She had nothing left in her. She gets up after that long time of praying and weeping, confessing the things she had done that were wrong in her life that she knew of. She stood up with all those church ladies around her. The preacher announced to the church that this morning Amy came forward because she wanted to be saved and that she had just finished praying through at the altar. He now pronounced, praise God, Amy has found Jesus today. Our third and final story this morning is about a teenager named Billy. Different church. Didn't know either of the other two individuals. Billy walked the aisle in church and got Saved about two years ago. He asked Christ to save him. He got baptized about two years ago. But for the last year of Billy's life as a teenager, like so many other teenagers, Billy was battling with a particular sin in his life. No one else knew what the sin was. But Billy was battling with a particular sin in his life that was just between him and God. He had gotten saved. He knew that he was saved. He had even gotten baptized. 
but he was dealing with sin in his life. He went on a youth retreat one Christmas with the other teenagers from his church and heard an evangelist preach at a youth retreat. He became under conviction during the youth retreat for the sin that he had been doing that nobody else even knew about. The secret sin in his life. And he went forward at the youth retreat and knelt and prayed. He didn't tell anyone what he had prayed about or why he went to the altar. He just went and prayed. When he got back home, the pastor of the church that he attended, where he was a member, invited everyone who had come forward during the youth retreat to confess sin in their lives to raise their hand. Anybody that confessed sins in your life at the youth retreat, would you raise your hand? The church had a number of youth and a good number of the youth raised their hands that they had gone forward and confessed sins in their lives at the youth retreat. The preacher then announced that now that you've gotten those sins right in your life, and you've gotten saved or saved again, you need to be baptized. Billy had already gotten saved two years before this. But now he was being told that because he had gone and confessed sin at the youth retreat, he must have gotten saved again. He needed to be baptized again. He went through with getting baptized again, but really all he was now was confused. Some of the other members of the church, including some younger youth in the church, had seen Billy get saved and baptized two years before that. Now, they were a little confused too, but he was doing what the preacher said to do. He had gotten re-saved, and now he was getting re-baptized. By the way, this is the reason that some churches have so many baptisms. Some churches, even some big churches, just minutes from where you sit this morning. Half the baptisms they had this last year were people they'd already baptized. They were rebaptizing them, the same people. And it's the reason that some churches leave more people confused about being saved than helping them. Now, I just shared with you three very different stories, but they're all real stories. And those same exact things happen in churches all across America on a regular basis. It's because people, including a lot of preachers, have some misconceptions about what this book says about what repentance is when it comes to being saved. The definition of repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart. I like it the way my youth pastor put it years ago when I was growing up. He put it in terms that even teenagers could understand. By the way, teenagers aren't always the brightest. Their brains stop working about the time they hit 13, Brother John, and they turn back on hopefully sometime after they leave their teenage years. I know it happened to me too. But he said that the word repent is a verb. Repentance is the noun form. And the word literally means you're going in one direction and then all of a sudden you do an about face, a 180, and you start back going the opposite direction from the one you were traveling. He said that's an illustration of what the word repent literally means. It means to be going this way, to do an about face, and start going this way, the opposite direction. That's what the word repent literally means. And Jesus himself preached that men needed to repent in order to be saved. Listen to Mark chapter 1 verse 15. 
Speaking of Jesus, it says, saying, the, key, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, you and I know what the gospel is. The word literally means good news. But you and I know what the gospel is. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You say, how could Jesus be preaching that they needed to believe the gospel when he had not even died on the cross at that point? Well, just hold those thoughts. We'll try to answer that question in just a couple of minutes. But I suppose if we took a survey of Americans in general, and even Christians in particular, in America, and we asked the question that I asked starting this morning, of what must a person repent to be saved? I would suppose 90% of the people we asked would give the same answer. Don't answer out loud, but if we asked the question of, a room full of a hundred people just from out in the public, of what must a person repent to be saved, you'd get the same answer that you'd get in a lot of churches if you asked a hundred people. The answer would be the same over and over and over again. Of what must a person repent to be saved, the answer would be sin. You must repent of your sin. That's what saves a person. You must repent of your sin. Sins, plural. But dear friends, that is not the gospel that is preached in the New Testament. Preacher, what are you saying this morning? That people shouldn't repent of their sins? I didn't say people shouldn't repent of their sins. I said that's not the repentance that saves a person from hell. All right, preacher, I don't know where you're going with this, but I'm going to listen and see what you have to say. I hope that's where you're at this morning. You see, repent does not always mean repenting of sin. In fact, there are several instances in the Old Testament where the Bible says that God Himself repented. God didn't have any sin of which to repent. So the word repent, to do a 180, to do an about face, to be going in one direction and to change and go in the other direction, does not always mean that the word repent, even in Scripture, is about repenting of sins. Repentance in the New Testament. What saves a person, the repentance mentioned in the gospel, is not the repentance of your sins that you've committed. Now, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 3. The next few passages we'll see this morning are all in the book of Acts. You won't have to turn far. Please look at them with me. The first instance of the gospel once delivered to the saints, recorded in the book of Acts, occurs on the day of Pentecost, that famous occasion where Peter and John preached. Those that were in Jerusalem heard the gospel preached in their own tongue, all of them, and there were 3,000 people who were saved that day, on the day of Pentecost. Listen to what Peter said in the next chapter, Acts 3, verses 18 and 19. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all His prophets, that Christ should suffer, He had so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now Peter says that you need to be converted. You're converted by repenting. 
And if you do those things, your sins will be blotted out. But he doesn't say here that the thing you need to repent of is your sins. He told us in the verse just before that, that what he was preaching was that Jesus was the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies and that Christ had to suffer and that he had fulfilled it. You see, Peter preached Jesus and being converted. The word converted is the same as repent. It means to do a 180. The word converted means change to the opposite. You were heading this way, now you need to be heading this way. He was not talking about repenting of their sins when he was giving this gospel message. He was preaching that Jesus had fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, that he suffered and had fulfilled the prophecies when he died on the cross. In his death, his burial, and His resurrection. You see, those to whom Peter was preaching were Jews who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. And they did not believe He had died on the cross for any reason other than He was a blasphemer. That's why they believed He died on the cross. It's why the Jewish religious leaders had Him crucified by the Romans. So they believed this about Jesus. Are you watching me this morning? They believed Jesus. They believed this about Jesus. He was a blasphemer and he deserved to die. But what Peter preached is that's not true. He preached that Jesus is the Messiah. The fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That he had to suffer and die and that he did do that for your sin. For your punishment. Be converted, Peter said. This is what you believed about Jesus. Now this is what you need to believe about Jesus. That he died, was buried, and rose again to pay for your wrongdoing. And that if you will repent of what you've believed about Jesus and be converted, you will have your sins forgiven. But the message was the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That they had to believe something different than what they had been believing about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Turn over, if you would, to Acts chapter 8. And we see Philip address the very same thing. The very same question. The question of salvation. What must I do to be saved? In Acts chapter 8, look at verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Remember, Philip's sitting in the, he's standing in the chariot up there with the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch had been reading out of what Old Testament passage of scripture? Isaiah 53. The chapter in Isaiah that talks about the crucifixion even though it was written 700 years before the crucifixion. In all honesty, the book of Isaiah chapter 53 gives a more detailed account of the crucifixion than anything Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John recorded. Isaiah recorded it to a T. But the Ethiopian eunuch didn't know what he was reading who he was reading about. So God brought Philip along the way to explain to the Ethiopian eunuch who wanted to know. He explained to him, and the Bible says, he preached unto him Jesus. That is, he showed how Jesus was the one that Isaiah 53 was talking about. And he preached unto him Jesus that was that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those things from the Old Testament about the Messiah that would come. He preached unto him Jesus. 
Look at verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? By the way, this is another way we know that baptism is to be dunked and immersed totally under the water. Otherwise, the Ethiopian eunuch could have taken his canteen and said, Hey, here's water. Would you just go ahead and baptize me if all you had to do was sprinkle or pour? No, he waited till they got to a pool of water there on the side of the way, and he said, here's water. What must I do to be saved? Or what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Notice Philip did not say, if you will repent of all your sins, you may be saved. He did not say, if you will name all the things you've done wrong that you can remember with a right heart, with a right attitude, with a sorrowful spirit, you'll be saved. And you can be baptized. He didn't tell him that. He said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Okay, well, preacher, what is he saying he had to believe with all his heart? Well, he had to believe with all his heart what, P, uh, what Philip had just preached unto him. Philip preached unto him Jesus from Isaiah 53. That Jesus, in his death, his burial, and his resurrection is the payment for our sin, our substitutionary atonement. That's what he had to believe. We know that's what he had to believe, and we know that the Ethiopian eunuch understood that's what he had to believe to be saved, because look what the Ethiopian eunuch says. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then you say, preacher is just saying Jesus is the Son of God enough to be saved. No, that's not enough by itself to be saved. But Philip knew that when the Ethiopian eunuch admitted <coughs> that Jesus is the Son of God, the Ethiopian eunuch was saying, I believe everything I just read in Isaiah 53 is about Jesus. And I believe everything that you've told me from the Old Testament Scriptures <coughs> about the Messiah is about Jesus. And everything you just told me about His death, His burial, and His resurrection is about Jesus and was for me. You see, the Ethiopian eunuch understood what Philip was preaching. That's why Philip said... Now I'll baptize you. Because he believed. So what was it that the Ethiopian eunuch repented of? He repented not of all the sins he had done, although he was like me and you. Undoubtedly the Ethiopian had plenty of sins he had done. There's no discussion of his sins per se. What Philip preached unto him is Jesus. And what he asked the Ethiopian eunuch to make sure he understood before he would baptize him is that he believed that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for his sins. So what the Ethiopian eunuch repented of is that before this, he didn't know about Jesus. He didn't know who Isaiah 53 was about. Why they did what they did in Isaiah 53 and what it had to do with him. But when he repented, now he knew it was about Jesus. He not only knew it with his mind, he believed it in his heart. He repented of what he believed about Jesus. And that now he was believing on Jesus. That's what he repented of that saved his soul in a moment and led Philip to agree to baptize him. 
You say, well, that was just Philip's opinion, and Philip was just taking a guess as to whether he understood or not. No, nope. this is a man that God picked up five minutes later and just poof, vanished him away and dropped him back down somewhere else. This was a man that was walking with God, and what he told the Ethiopian was the gospel truth. But he did not preach repentance of sins for salvation. He, re, he preached repentance in what he believed about Jesus. Stay in the book of Acts, but turn to chapter 16 if you would. We've seen what Peter preached about repentance. We've seen what Philip preached about repentance for salvation. Now let's see what Paul preached about repentance Necessary for salvation. In Acts 16 verse 31, it says this. <coughs> Speaking to the Philippian jailer who had just asked the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas did not say, Make a list of your sins. That's the starting point. Name all those sins you can think of to Jesus. Or just lump them all together in a pile and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. He didn't say that. He didn't even address his sins at this point. No, that's not what it was about. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You see, he didn't tell the Philippian jailer, repent of the bad things you're doing and start going the other direction, not doing those things anymore. Now, should he do those things? Yes, he should. But that's not what Paul said saves a person. The Philippian jailers go in this way. He doesn't know anything about Jesus. He's not trusting Jesus. He doesn't know anything about the death, burial, and resurrection. And he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul then preached unto him Jesus. The same thing Philip preached to the Ethiopians. The same thing Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What he repented of in that jail was not believing on Jesus because he didn't even know about Jesus. He repented from not trusting Christ for his salvation to trusting Christ for his salvation. And he was miraculously saved like you were miraculously saved on the day that you got saved. This was not repentance of sins. This was repentance of what he was trusting and believing about Jesus. Preacher, where are you going with this? Hold on. Don't let me lose you. Stay with me. Now, still in the book of Acts, look at the next chapter. Acts 17, verse 27. This is again Paul preaching. In Acts 17, look down to verse 27. <coughs> Paul is preaching in Athens on Mars Hill, where he saw that statue to the unknown God. The Greeks had so many gods and goddesses, they were worried about maybe forgetting one of them, leaving one out by accident. So they had a statue to the unknown God in case they had missed one that they should have listed. Here's what Paul said in his preaching. Acts 17, verse 27. That they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, For we are also His offspring. 
For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. At the times of, his, of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Paul says, God commands all men everywhere now to repent. Did he just get through talking to them about all the wicked things they did in Athens? Nope. But I assure you, there was a lot of wickedness that went on in Athens. And the people listening to him had lots and lots and lots of sins. But he didn't preach unto them their sins and the need to repent of their sins if they wanted to be saved. He preached unto him, unto them, Jesus. He told them about Jesus. That they needed to seek Jesus. He said, I've come to tell you about the unknown God that you don't know about yet. And he preached to them Jesus. What did they need to repent of? All their sins? Well, they needed to repent of those but that wasn't going to save them. They needed to repent of not believing on Jesus. That's what they needed to repent of if they wanted to be saved. You say, preacher, how do we know when Paul was talking in Acts chapter 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and how do we know here in Acts 17 that what Paul meant when he said believe on the Lord Jesus? Maybe he really meant confessing your sins, repenting of your sins, and that's how somebody gets saved. We know that's not what Paul meant because uh, thankfully Paul wrote the book of Romans and he told us very clearly in chapter 10 exactly what a person must believe to be saved. He said in Romans 10, you know the verses, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no mention by Paul in the gospel of confessing your sins and asking forgiveness of your sins to save you. Should you do that after you get saved? Oh yes, you should do that. We all should do that. But that's not what saves a person. Asking for forgiveness of your sins does not save a person. What saves a person is believing in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus as my Savior. Now, am I going to ask Him to save me if I don't need to be saved from something? Probably not. It's my sin that helps me to understand that I need to be saved. But asking forgiveness of sins is not the same thing as believing on Jesus. It might accompany it, but it's not the same thing. The repentance required for salvation is is turning from not believing on Jesus and trusting Him to save me to trusting Him to save me. That's the repentance that saves a soul from hell. One last passage I'll ask you to turn to with me this morning is John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. I know you're already familiar with the passage. It's John 3.16. It's Jesus speaking to Nicodemus who asks the question, how can a man be born again? And Jesus explains to him. Look at John chapter 3, verse 16. You already know it, but look at it with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved. You see, Jesus is telling Nicodemus he can only be saved through believing in the Son of God. Who's he talking about when he says the Son of God? He's talking about himself. And he's carrying on a conversation with Nicodemus and he says, you must believe in the Son of God. Nicodemus knew who he was talking about. He was talking about himself. There was no question in Nicodemus' mind. By the way, if your Bible in verse 16 says he gave his one and only son instead of his only begotten son, take that Bible, go do something with it, give it away, or better yet, uh, put it away and get you one that says His only begotten Son. Because Jesus is not God's one and only Son. I'm one of God's sons. If you're saved, you're one of His sons or daughters. But He only has one begotten Son. That's Jesus. But Jesus is saying you must believe on the Son. So look back at verse 14. What about the Son did Nicodemus have to believe? Look at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. When Jesus said, the Son of Man be, must be lifted up, even as the serpent in the wilderness, do you think Nicodemus knew what he was saying about being lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness? I promise you, Nicodemus knew what he meant. Nicodemus was uh, uh, skilled and educated in the law of Moses. He knew the story of the children of Israel in the wilderness when Moses put that serpent on a pole, like God told him to do, and God healed their bodies and forgave their sins. How much of the details he knew about what was coming up for Jesus with the crucifixion, I don't know. But he understood that Jesus was saying, the Son of Man must be lifted up on a pole. I strongly suspect, living in the world in which they lived, with crucifixion being the preeminent form of execution in the Roman Empire... I imagine a light went on for Nicodemus if it had not before. But in any event, he came to understand that Jesus was saying, if you want to have everlasting life, eternal life, whatever you've been trusting for eternal life, you've got to put the brakes on, come to a halt, do an about face, and you've got to put your faith solely in the Son of God to save you. What were the Pharisees and the Sadducees teaching you had to do? Why, you had to keep the law. You had to do the works of the law if you wanted to be born again. Or be saved is the term, perhaps, to find God. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said you've got to put away those false notions and believe on the Son of God, that He must be lifted up as the serpent in the wilderness. I'm getting close to finishing. Please don't turn me off early today. Please listen to the very end. What Jesus preached to Nicodemus that He must do to be saved was not repenting of His sins, but repenting of believing on the Son of God for His salvation. Look at verse 18 in John chapter 3. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because, why? Because of all the bad things He did last week? Nope. Because one reason. He hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
This is Jesus talking. If you've got a red letter edition, it's in red. Jesus says, He that believeth on the Son hath life. But he that believeth not, in other words, somebody that's trusting anything else than the Son to save him, is condemned already. Why is he condemned already? Is it because he stole something? Broke something that wasn't his? Hurt somebody? Said some unkind things? Didn't keep the Sabbath day? Didn't honor his father and his mother? Coveted something? Are those the reasons that he's condemned already? No. Those things are wrong. But those aren't the reasons Jesus said he's condemned already. He's condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Because he's not believed on Jesus. Because he's not believed that Jesus would be raised like the serpent in the wilderness as the payment for his sin. He's not put his faith in the Son of God. That's why he's condemned already. It's not that laundry list of bad things he's done that's condemning him to hell. It's because he's not believed on Jesus. Do you see now why it's so important that the the pagans living in the deep, dark recesses of any place that hadn't heard the gospel needs to hear the gospel? Because the Bible declares there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The universalists who want to teach and preach that everybody's going to heaven, no matter what religion they believe, no matter what God they worship, if they believe it sincerely with all their heart, hey, we're all going to make it there. Rick Warren can preach it. Billy Graham can preach it. The curly-headed preacher can hint around about it, and all the others. That's not what this book says. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's only through belief in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, repenting of what you're trusting to get you to heaven, and trusting solely in Jesus. That will save us all. No friends. Being sorry for your sins. Does not save you. From hell. Confessing your sins. Will not save you from hell. The Buddhists can be as sincere. As they want to be. About being sorry for the bad things they've done. The Buddhists. The Hindus. And the Muslims all. Can be sorry for the bad things they've done. But unless they turn to Jesus and believe on His death, burial, and resurrection, they will not be in heaven. The Roman Catholics who are sincerely sorry for the bad things they do and do all their works of penitence and go into confession to try to pay for their sins so they can make it to heaven, they're not going to make it there. Because it's not confessing sin that saves a person's soul. It is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as my substitute, my Savior. That and nothing added to it. It's the reason that Martin Luther was such a, uh, was such a distraught Catholic priest, discouraged and despondent. He was such a sincere Catholic before he got saved And so sincerely sorry for his sins, he wrote in his own autobiography that he would go around beating himself, whipping himself because he was sorry for his sins. Thinking that that, because of the teachings of the Catholic Church, was what saved a person from their sins. But dear friend, being sorry for your sins doesn't save anyone from hell. It's not repentance of sins, it's repentance of not trusting Jesus. 
The repentance of sin may lead someone to the cross, but it will not save them. The publican in Luke 18 is a good example of this. The publican in the parable that Jesus told knew he was a sinner. And it was his knowledge that he was a sinner that made him come to Jesus and want to be saved. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Confessing his sins, repenting of his sins didn't save him. But it brought him to the one who could save him. It made him conscious of the fact that he needed a Savior. So there is a role for repentance of sins to play in salvation. If it shows someone that they need to get saved, that's wonderful. But just repenting of your sins won't save anyone. The stories that I led off with this morning, Larry and Amy, they came to an altar, sorry for the things they had done wrong, sincerely sorry, but because no one preached unto them Jesus, they got up and walked away believing, like so many people in churches all across America. That because they came and confessed their sins and repented of the bad things they had been doing, repented of their sins, they got up and walked away thinking that they were saved because they were sorry for their sins. But if they did not accept Christ and His payment for them, they walked away as lost as when they came to the altar. And shame on the preachers, including a few Baptists, more than a few, who have allowed people to think that coming to the altar and confessing their sins saved their soul and they let them walk back down the aisle as lost as when they arrived. Shame on those preachers. I'm going to tell you it happens in every assembly of God every Sunday. Get upset with a preacher or don't. It happens in every church of God. Happens in every holiness church. Happens in every other Pentecostal church. Happens in most Methodist churches. Most Lutheran churches. And a few Baptists. And a whole bunch of non-denominationals and others across the board. Because people have been taught... By wrong example, that confessing your sins, repenting of your sins, is salvation. That's not salvation. It might bring you to the foot of the cross, but that's where you meet Jesus. He's the one that can save. So preacher, why is this even important? Why does it even matter if we're already saved? Well, first of all, if you're lost, you've got to know what's going to get you to heaven in order to get saved. But if you're saved, it's still important because how are you going to effectively win a soul to Christ if you have some confusion in your mind about what it is that saves a person's soul? Jesus saves a person's soul. Confessing sins and repenting of sins does not save a soul. The role of repentance in salvation. There is a need for repentance in our Christian lives after we're saved. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, Godly sorrow worketh repentance. He was talking to save people that needed to get some things right after getting saved. But you can't have godly sorrow without having God in here. That's for after you get saved. Getting right with God. But a person who wishes to be saved, will not get there just by repenting of their sins. Would you stand with me please quietly and reverently? Miss Mary, if you'll come play. Brother Jim, we won't even sing this morning for our invitation. I just feel led to do it a little differently. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that Father, you would help us to understand that we are sinners, that we need a Savior, but Lord, help us not to trust in our repenting of our sins to save our soul. 
but to realize that you and you alone can save us all. That believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, His death and burial and resurrection for our sins is what saves us all. Help us to get it right. Lord, so we know for sure we're saved. That we've done what the Bible says. Lord, it's possible there could be someone even listening to this message that, Lord, they were confused or misled years ago. Maybe they need to be saved. For those that are already saved, Lord, we need to understand with clarity the gospel message if we're going to effectively win others to you. Use this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.